Okay, just some breaking news to bring you. I'm very, it's afraid to say it's some sad news for Kieran Dyer because he has been managing a problem with his liver for a number of years now. I'll never forget it. It was so surreal when she was like, I've looked at your bloods and I looked at the MRI. You're going to need a liver transplant. I thought I was, I basically thought I was a goner. He was such a fantastic, talented young player. He could have been anything he wanted. They always say, a footballer's career is when you're young, it should be looking like that. Mine was like that. Went to train that morning, came back in the afternoon. He just said, we've accepted a bid from Newcastle. The more I see it is, I should have gone to Arsenal. I remember just walking down the hill, going to a restaurant and this taxi just skids. The taxi driver's trying to drag me into the taxi. How dare you show your face out here? I'm just like, this is fanatical, like. Oh, there's a fight going on here between two Newcastle players. Kieran Dyer and Lee Bowyer are having a fight. All I kept remember thinking is, I cannot believe he's throwing punches at me in front of 52,000 people, but he's like that. He, these players, they play on the edge. The next day in the paper, it said, England star in rape case. So I had the whole country thinking that I was part of this massive, what was it, roasting scandal when I wasn't even there. Next thing I'm awake and petrified to open my eyes. It just seems like it's going on eternity and I finally shift up and, and I can remember ringing her and I was going to tell her. So it's like literally, it's ringing, it's ringing and you're like, pick up, pick up. And as soon as she picks up, he comes out of the door and just stands there like that going. So that mental torture that went on for two or three years of not knowing when you're going to be isolated with him again and just like a sexual predator, it was just... But it wasn't until I met Anne and Foxy where they really changed my life. And in the show, it got edited, but I actually say they thank you for saving my life because I'm not a victim no more. Because if I'm a victim, then that fucking evil twat wins. And um, this monster, or well, this fucking prick, turned me into a monster. When I come out of here, I am not a victim of sexual abuse no more. Because every time I'm a victim, he wins. You're a fucking brave man. A brave man. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing and CBD Cardiff. If you haven't already, make sure you press that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. Today, as you can tell, we're not in the central club. Uh, we're not actually in the country. We are now in uh, sunny England, Colchester, and we're interviewing someone very, very special. Um, in this day and age, celebrities, politicians, sports stars, we look at them like they can do no wrong. But if there's one thing I've learned since interviewing people on the central club, that that's far from the truth. The man sat next to me today is someone who's been in and out of the media all his career for some of the good reasons and mostly bad. Um, but in recent years, he's opened up about his abusive childhood, and which I think is a brave thing to do, and is now waiting for a liver transplant as we speak due to a disease known as PSC. We're here today to inspire others from his story alone, and I'm, a priv I'm just privileged to be here, basically. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you, Mr. Kieran Dyer. How are you doing? Thank you for coming, Key. Great introduction. Um, Honoured that you've come out of sunny Wales to come and see sunny Suffolk. Well, <laughs> Essex really Colchester, but you're nearly close to sunny Suffolk. Yeah, when, when, when we came in, I think the sign said it was the, the first city of the UK or the first city of England. Is that true? I have no idea. <laughs> you meant to be I my tour no guide. Idea. I have no idea. I just know that everyone who comes to this part of the world, they don't end up leaving. So uh, I don't know about that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? It's funny actually because it was actually raining in in Cardiff, and when we got over the bridge, it stopped. It stopped raining, so you know it was sunny England. 
Thank you for coming, mate, honestly. And before we start, I just want to say a massive thank you to Craig Bellamy as well for making this happen. Um, you're, you're pulling a face there, like, you know, he's a top guy in my eyes, I think. And, you know, the fact he's managed to get us together is unbelievable. What do you think of Craig? He's my best friend in football. Uh, one of my best friends. Um, like, as we go on in this podcast, I'm a very guarded person to, so to let people in. Um, I have to really build a trust with this person and he's someone I really trust. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be doing this podcast. Just put it this way. He's like, do you want to do a podcast? I was like, Bellas, fuck off. <laughs> he's like, come on, you got to do a favour for me. He's top guy. He's, they're top people. And uh, here we are. So Nah, for him to even vouch for us like that yeah, is amazing. Brilliant. So yeah, let's talk a bit about Craig and your relationship then before we, we kind of jump in. Because, you know, starting off, you were both kind of rivals in a way, weren't you? Um, I'm sure he played for Norwich. You played for Ipswich. Yeah. So um, he came all the way from Cardiff to Norwich as a youth team player. He was uh, one of the golden boys of their youth team. I was probably one of the golden boys of um, Ipswich's youth team at the time. We used to play each other. We were rivals. We didn't used to like each other. Ipswich and Norwich are East Anglian rivals. Um and I made my first team debut before him, a few months before him. So I beat him to a first team debut. And I can remember we were playing, played at Carroll Road. It was a first team game and he was on the bench. And uh, he comes on after 60 minutes. And, uh, he comes straight for me, makes a beeline straight for me. He's like, you're fucking shit. And I'm like, hang on a minute, are you the one who just come off the subs bench and I'm actually starting the <laughs> game with that. And it was just kind of like, we hated each other all throughout our uh, careers at Ipswich and Norwich. I obviously moved to Newcastle. A year later, he moves to Coventry. He gets them relegated. <laughs> 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 he gets them relegated. And then I can remember, um, obviously, the Ipswich connection. So, so Bobby Robson, he took Charlie Woods as his chief chief uh, scout and Charlie was like uh, we're going to sign Craig Bellamy and I'm like you what he's like yeah we're going to sign Craig Bellamy um, I tried to get you and Craig to Tottenham because he was before he went to Newcastle with Bobby he was Tottenham's chief scout with George Graham and he was trying to get me and Craig uh, George Graham to buy me and Craig Bellamy um so I thought, okay, we're going for Craig Bellamy. So I deliberately came into training early that day and was first in the change room. And he's come walking by and I'm thinking, here we go. It could kick off here. But we got on like a house on fire straight away. And um, yeah, the rest is history. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Mm. You know, and what is it, 25 years later? Something like that, 20 years later now? You're still... Yeah, 20 years later. 20 years later. Um yeah, and it is weird. It's, like you said, it, our careers kind of mirrored each other. Um, Going back, like, um, at them days, how would you have communicated with him at Ipswich and you at Norwich? Because it seems to me like you had some sort of communication between each other. Where you, was it just a matter of time? When Was it just only when, like, Norwich would play Ipswich? Or was there some sort of place where you could kind of, you know... Because he was living up here as well, weren't you? And it's not too far from Ipswich. So before he before he made the youth team, uh, they played for this. We played for our Sunday teams, and um, that Norwich basically had a a put together a Sunday team that went in just to a regular league. And our league, in our league, we were winning everything, and then all of a sudden, basically Norwich's youth team comes in, starts battering everyone. So. That kind of pissed me off. That yeah. They're taking all our success here. And <laughs> he, like I said, he was a chirpy on the pitch. Are oh, you like not winning everything fucking now? Are you? Da, 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 da. <laughs> and like you said, so then every time there was the Ipswich Norwich game coming up, you knew what to expect, not just from him, but from all of them, Drew Broughton and Adrian Forbes. Now, they had, like I said, they had a decent youth team. Um, but because I'm a local boy in Ipswich and Ipswich and Norwich is not too far and I kind of knew people from Norwich, I'd always send the message to yeah. that little so-and-so that <laughs> we'll see him in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how are things for you now, Key? Um, I know you're going through a trans, you're waiting for your transplant. Can you uh, 
you know, let the people know exactly what's going on right now. Yeah, so um, I officially went on the uh, the transplant list on January the 4th. Um, the, the liver specialist was saying that it should take between three to six months for me to get a liver. So we're four months in, so... It could be any time. Like I said, we could be doing this podcast, my phone ring, and I've got to see you later. You've got to wait. You've got to, <laughs> yeah. No, we started. I've got to wait an hour. I've got a, I've got a, um, a new liver to, re, to, to get. So um, it is very testing because um, your life is on hold. Um, it's just unexpected. Um, usually when I'm through my football career, when I've had operations, you're having an operation on a Thursday at 11 o'clock. This is just totally, someone's going to have the unfortunate accident of dying, um, which sounds horrific, but that someone dying is going to help me live my life. So you you only haven't got just a commitment to yourself. You've got a commitment to the person who's given you yeah, their liver yeah. and their family that you've got to do them justice because... Obviously, their life is taken away, and I've got to live my life to the fullest to um, for them as well. So it's it is a it is a hell of a lot to digest. Um, and like I said, when I got the news in the October time, to say it was a wow, um, it was horrible how I found out, and um, yeah, I was. For about a couple of weeks, um, a few of the I was working at Ipswich Academy, I was doing the under twenty threes, and a few of the academy staff were saying to me, "Your eyes are yellow," and uh, I checked the mirror and I thought, "Yeah, my eyes are yellow. Maybe I'm tired." And because I've always had a liver problem since early two thousands, like when I get ill, I get ill quite bad. It takes me longer to recover and stuff because obviously because of my liver. So I just thought, oh, maybe um, I've got a virus or something. It's long COVID. I just had COVID. I went to Wembley for the Euro final. I got COVID. Maybe it's taken me a long time to get over the COVID. Um, and they just kept mentioning your eyes and then little things at night, like I could drink and hydrate so well, but every time I'd go to the toilet to take a slash, it was like dark orange, dark orange. I could smell drink. as well. Not really, but I could like I could drink liter after liter yeah. of water, and it would just never be clear. And again, I'm thinking, bloody hell, long COVID must be long COVID. Um, and then uh, I had diarrhea, kind of every time I went to the toilet it was never solid. And then when I was checking the color of my uh, of my stalls, they were like, what? Well, it was basically white. It wasn't brown. And I was thinking, you know, something's not right here. Um, and then I did the Newcastle Tottenham game for Sky um, when the takeover happened. So we went up to St. James's Park. It was me, David Ginola doing the game with Jamie Redknapp. And even the Sky producers, after I'd come off set, they, they were texting my agent saying, Kieran needs to get checked out his eyes weren't looking right and stuff like that uh my my wife rings me her sister um works in the hospital as well she said i've just seen kieran on hospital make sure he goes to the a and e as soon as he gets back don't even book a doctor just go to the a and e so now i'm starting to like what the hell um so i got back on the sunday evening spoke to the club doctor at ipswich he said, go up to the A&E, they're waiting for you. Um, and I went into the A&E. Um, they took some bloods. I think I had an MRI scan. And um, I'll never forget it. It was so surreal. I'd um, They wake you up really early in hospital, <laughs> really early. They do the round they really, do the round really early. It's just like, what the hell? It's like a got to sleep really late they wake you up about six o'clock and they obviously have one of the specialists of that hospital come around at the time and uh they always have a junior they have a junior with him and they say hi 
I'm blah de blah and um, this is one of the juniors. Do you mind her being in? And I'm like, no, no, I've still got sleep on the, still sleep in my morning breath and even brush my teeth. <laughs> and she was like, I've looked at your bloods and I looked at the MRI. You're going to need a liver transplant. And then she went, um, I'll just let you digest and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. And she just went out. So there's me at like 6.30 in the morning thinking, fucking hell. Um, liver transplant. I basically thought it was the end of my life. I was like, what the hell? So then I had to ring my wife and she was like, did they say that? I said, I didn't even get a chance to ask a question. She was like, well, I, you need to answer this. You need to get a second opinion. You need to da 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 da. And I could see that she was stressed. Then I rang my mum again. My mum, you could just see the panic in their voice. So now I'm the one with the bad news, but because I can see the reactions of certain people, I'm trying to be strong for them, if you know what I mean. It's, it was crazy. So I was like putting on a brave face. And then, um, after I come off the phone to them, I rang another one of my close friends, DJ Spoonie, Jonathan. You, you, you probably, Shout out to Spoonie. Yeah, Spoonie. So then I rang up to Spoonie and then it just came out. I just, I just said I need a liver transplant and just broke down. And he was like, again, he was just like, I know people who have transplants and obviously a, a kidney's different, but Andy Cole's had a, a kidney transplant and medicine today and he kind of like uh, kind of softened the blow which that specialist should have done at that particular time and um, yeah I literally they I then had to go to Adam Brooks which is the major hospital in Cambridge where all the liver specialists are and I went there for five days of um Vigorous testing, every test you can think of, lungs, heart, bloods, blowing into things, grip tests, everything to see if I was a, um, a, a, a good enough candidate. So basically they kind of, if you would actually survive the operation. And it was the best possible thing for me because when I went there and I see the liver specialist, the, the actual surgeon, and I spoke to the liver coordinators... They told me like about the high, the high percentage of people who survive the liver transplant. I'm so young, I'm so fit. Usually, they operate on 60, 70 year olds who are weak and fragile, and and it kind of, it kind of got me in a positive mindset where I've always been a glass half empty kind of guy, but with this procedure. I'm quite, I'm, well, it's not quite, I'm really positive. I know that I'll end up becoming better because, like I said, I've always had the liver problem. And to have a new liver, it's going to give me a new lease of life. And um, so, yeah, so from that dark day in the hospital to, listen, I'm not going to beat around the bush. A 10-hour operation is going to, I'm going to have some, some dark days of recovery and it's going to be a lot of pain and, a lot of stress and a lot of turmoil, but I know at the end of it, I'm going to come back and uh, I'm going to smash it. And uh, again, being that competitive person that I am, I've already set myself challenges. I've already asked the, what's the record of someone leaving the hospital after a liver transplant? And they're like, it's 10 days. I said, well, I'm going to be out of here in nine days and giving myself little things to try and achieve. And um Yeah. The only, the only bit now is just the waiting around. It's like your whole life is like, obviously I've left Ipswich Academy now. I can't go and uh, progress my coaching journey um, at the moment because I could, like I said, I could be going for a job interview. And like, I'll see you later. I'll, I'll be back in three months after I've, yeah, I've recovered yeah. from the liver transplant. But yeah, um, I'm in a good place. And I think now that people can see my positive outlook, I think my family are in a good place as well. It's just everyone wants it to happen so we can start that process now rather than the wait and the waiting is just torturous. I think you look fantastic, to be honest, mate. Cheers, You look really, really well. Cheers. Did they 
give you any medication whilst you're waiting out is it then because obviously if you your eyes were yellow and whatever else beforehand so they just pumped me full of iv of antibiotics um they obviously so because my liver is not working so well it starts to take protein out of your muscles and stuff so they give you how much protein you're meant to be eating during the day uh, at night they give you every they do every possible you the amount of they've got a team that's what i mean it's not about just the surgeon they've got a team they've got a psych a psychiatrist a psychologist they a, a liver coordinator someone who checks your lungs your the actual surgeon there's about a team of about 15 of them and they've wow. all got all their jobs are as important so like i said in that five six days it was just like <laughs> the amount of people i met yeah um this is happening near because I know us coming up here, you're, you're, you're not allowed to be out of a 90 mile radius or something. Yeah, isn't it? so they say, <clears throat> they give you two hours, but they say um, to be in a, an hour and a half radius of Edinburgh set at, at all times. So you can't go on holiday or I can't go up to mm. north to, uh, to Newcastle or Manchester because like you said, once they someone passes away or they get a liver, they have machines that can pump the liver full of blood, but the liver will die eventually. So you've got to get to the hospital within two if hours. You miss the ship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're very strict on it as well. You have to take it serious. If you do miss, like you, you give your three numbers, my number, my wife's number, and my mum's number. If they try to call you and you miss the call, then off the don't off the transplant list you go. And, if you drink alcohol, I haven't drunk alcohol since 2014, we were just saying off air. But if they find out if you're on the list and you drink alcohol, off the list you go because this is serious. Like you said, you've got to do someone's liver justice. And if you're it's not. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, of course, yeah. Just, like just the missing the phone call yeah, thing, you know? Like, yeah, at night time, anytime <laughs> your phone beeps, you just start straight away. You've you got to have that phone yeah, charged yeah. up, mate. You've always got to have a. Um, You've always got to have an overnight stay bag packed and ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to that that time when they did say, you know, that, that woman just walked off kind of. How was you feeling? Like, you know. So, again, because I've always had, so in 2002, I got diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, which is another condition of the liver. Um, it means that my immune system, uh, I couldn't, it was struggling to fight off things that were attacking the liver. Um, so I've always been on medication for that. And um, and then I had another specialist in around the Ipswich area when I retired called Dr. Simon Williams. So he'd always looked after me. And he probably diagnosed me probably about four or five years ago. He said that he thinks I've got a condition called PSC, which develops scarring in your tubes and um and i was like what's the cure for that he said well certain medication it's not a cure it kind of prevents yeah yeah it just tapers it down but you're going to eventually need a liver transplant but the way we were talking he was talking he was thinking maybe 65 70 yeah. so again so for when they came in just from an MRI and a blood test to say you need a liver transplant. It was just like, I thought I was, I basically thought I was a goner. Yeah. I just thought, what the hell? There was no explanation. They didn't tell me with medicine today and the, the success rate. And it was just, it was just so much to digest. I've, and it was the first thing in the morning to wake up. I hadn't even had a slice of toast yet. It was just, you're going to need a liver transplant. We're waiting for a bed at Adam Brooks. I'll just let you digest it. See you, see you tomorrow. Is it, you know, if you was uh, still in playing for Newcastle, if you were still in the height of your career and you had this same problem, it, would the waiting list be the same time as any other? Is it always the same type yeah. of waiting list? Yes. It's like, it's, no, it's not because. You know, he's a professional yeah, footballer. No, we need no, him. No, like, no. Way you get a lot of perks for being a footballer and you get to see the best specialist. This is, again, someone has to die and so many people need new organs. Um, the demand for organs 
is a lot more. And um, basically you get put on the kind of someone who's got two days to live will be put on a super urgent list, if you know what I mean. And then they have different lists for me. But why I'm kind of within the three to six months, because I've got liver d disease, if you leave this liver in for too long, so say in a year's time, that's when obviously tumours can develop, cancer can develop. So that's why they want to do it within the three to the six months. So like I said, I'm four months in and um, yeah, hopefully in the next couple of months I can definitely do it and then like I said progress my career yeah yeah definitely we'll talk a bit more about the future of your career yeah, going on course, yeah. I think what what we like to do with with everyone um, is take it back to the beginning mm -hmm. um, you know you've had a hell of a career but you've also had a hell of a life mm -hmm. and uh, it'd be nice to just take it back really from from where you're from and how, how was your childhood uh, my childhood was uh, again, just from Ipswich and the friends that I um, I had, it always seemed that we were living with our, our mums. They were single parents, and uh, it's not being being a racist or, but it was just back in them days in the circus we were going that my dad and his friends were <laughs> the head woman left, right, centre yeah. and my mum had had enough and um, so I was, yeah, I was born and raised in Ipswich. I was, um, I had a decent childhood because I was very athletic. I was the fastest. I was the best at long distance. I was good at football and when you have a gift, you kind of, um, you're the popular lads. I was just, I always say to my kids now, because they get to have proms and stuff like that, we never got to no. that. And I would say, I would have definitely been prom king. Yeah. <laughs> I would have had the pick of all the girls and all stuff like that. And they're like, yeah, whatever. I'm, so, I'm telling you. So, um, yeah, it was just, I love, ch I, I, obviously I love most of my childhood. Obviously we'll t touch on some of my childhood, but being a popular popular we didn't have a care in the world and um like i said i've just mentioned my dad my dad was probably one of the hardest men in the ipswich at the time which also had its perks as well because if any of the old kids used to i just say i just get my dad after you yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was that just when you say it, hardest would, would you say he was one of the nuttiest as well you know from some of the stories i mean he seems like he was a bit of a fucking boy yeah i remember so a good story of my dad is, I was probably about 10, 11, something like that. Very young. And him and his mates used to go down the park and take over the park and have a proper 11 v 11 uh, match. My dad's a bad loser. So his team was losing. And one of the players, Dodie, I see Dodie the other day, actually. Um, and Dodie lights up a cigarette and he's on my dad's team. And my dad's like, what are you doing? Put out that cigarette. And he's like, I'm a grown ass man. I'll do what I want. Blah, de, blah, de, blah. And my dad's like, who the fuck are you talking to? And daddy's like, shut up, Charlie. And he's like, shut up. And next thing, my dad just, I always remember it because it was a head bag with a head logo. And he just <laughs> walks off the pitch, goes to this head logo. And now comes this machete. I'm thinking, well, I didn't think at the time, but I'm thinking like, who carries a machete in a, in a head, a head bag. bag, yeah. And next thing he's chasing Dodie. And my dad is fast. That's why I got my speed from Fing. And he's like, Dodie had a good 50 metres head start because he's at the other end of the pitch. And he see, and everyone's like, Charlie, Charlie, trying to calm him down. But no one would go near him because he's yeah. got the machete. And like, you could see him gaining the game. He gets to about 20, 30 metres away from Dodie. And I'm thinking, what the hell? And Dodie <laughs> literally pushes a kid off his bike. <laughs> just gets on the bike and <laughs> starts thinking what made it worse to wind up my dad is like it deliberately slowed down so my dad was going then he'd be off again yeah. <laughs> just like wow so was, yeah was your dad from Ipswich or did he was he was originally from Antigua um, and he came over on the boat when a lot of the West Indians um, yeah. 
that are in our Ipswich community. They all come over across um, when he was probably about, so he was born in 55, so he probably come across when he was probably about 10. Um, uh, yeah, so he Is came over with his mum. His dad carried on working over there and was sending the money over him. And, uh, yeah. At that time, like, you know, 50s, obviously you said, must have been 80s, 90s when you was a boy. Um, was it much of a black community in Ipswich? Not really. Um, like I said, what was great about Ipswich is that they did have a Caribbean club. It was called the Caribbean Club. And that's where I used to learn how to play dominoes and <laughs> stuff like that. And it was like the West Indy community. That was their place to yeah. go. So obviously my dad used to take me up there a lot. And yeah, that was where all the black people of Ipswich, that was their their spot and they'd have their what they call it, like a Jamaican rave or they used, Sound to, call system, it, they used to call it a blues. So they used to have their blues up there, dominoes up there. Um, Lenny Austin, uh, another one close friend of my dad's, he used to have his karate classes where I used to go and do karate yeah. there and stuff like that. So uh, I wouldn't say Ipswich was populated with a lot of black people, but um, Ipswich did... Um, like I said, recognise the West Indian community and to have the Caribbean club is a shame it's shut down now. Um, so I go to a social club and play with the older, my dad's generation. I still go up there now and again and play dominoes with them, yeah. which I think they they appreciate and respect as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't an only child, you had sisters and how many of you was there? Uh, so with my mum and dad, I've got another sister uh, younger sister Kersha. I had a younger brother who died at childbirth, Mario. He was a year older than my sister. Um, and then I've got um, my dad had a uh, another low. <laughs> yeah, so Joanne um, is older than me. Um, and then, like I think I touched it on my book, uh, I was about 13, 14, and there was a knock at the door. And uh, some some guys at the door, I go, mum, some guys at the door, because he was like, is your mum in? It's like, yeah, mum, some guy at the door. And then I could hear my mum whispering at the door, I'm going in to probably watch Thundercats or something on the TV or <laughs> at that time. And then all of a sudden my mum brings him in and says, yeah, this is Mark, this is your brother. Yeah, so yeah. Um Yeah, so what I know of is I've got uh, a sister or brother who died and then um my dad had two previous children, Mark and Joanne as well. Um he reckons there could be more out there. <laughs> but with um, I never know. With Mario, um do you are you like some sort of like patron uh with Well yeah, it kind of uh, so when I did uh, we'll probably touch on it later. I did I'm a Celebrity and uh, uh, the Drew Brady Foundation, um, they lost a child, but he was a, it was a stillborn child. Uh, Mario wasn't stillborn. He was actually, he was born, he was alive, and then uh, a couple of hours later he died. Or, um, But I thought that kind of touched home quite a bit. So when I met Pete and... Um, Lynn, um, and I went to a few of their charity events and DJ Spoonie was a patron and he always has golf days for the charity and I love my golf and I went to play and he just asked me to be a patron. I thought, um, 
even though it is slightly different, it is a it, good it way of something, a yeah. good way of honouring Mario. So um, yeah, of course. And like you said, when I did the the jungle, I donated my um, I donated yeah, my nuns uh, to the charity, which um, which obviously helped the charity massively. Yeah. Did they pay you much for that? For the I'm a celeb coming forth. Was, would it was it would it be the same if you was a? I think you get paid by celebrity status. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that year, who do we have? We probably had Lady, I probably Lady C. Yeah, Chris Eubank would. <laughs> Eubank. I, I probably no one talks about what they obviously you see some of the figures that are, some people showing their pay slips. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a good story about a pay slip with a footballer. That was a good one. I'll never forget that. Go on. <laughs> we'll get to it later. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to it later. All right, let's 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 dive into the football. And so you was obviously a gifted baller. Did you do any other sports? So when you was a kid, you say you run fast. Did you play any other sports? No, I always knew I was going to be. So I was very good at karate. I was. Um, every competition I'd won, I'd go into, I'd win. Um, but then competitions always used to be on a Sunday. We used to have to play football on the Sunday, so I ditched the karate. And then, like you said, I was very good at athletics, especially cross country. Um, and I represented um, Suffolk at cross country. Then, when we had the counties, I came second in the whole of England. So I could have probably have had a, if I really dedicated, but. I always wanted to be a footballer. You're not getting much money off the old karate, are you? No, no, no. Compare, no. you know, yeah, karate. But then, but then I could have gone into MMA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. It was but it always going to be football. You know, the money yeah, back then, even nah. though MMA was special back, like UFC was special yeah. back then, you would have come in, you know, what they called you, gi. Yeah. Gi that died in his gi, like, do you know what I'm saying? George St. Pierre, he yeah. comes in his gi. Yeah. He did all right, I suppose, nah. It was always going to be football. Yeah. Um, and because it was so plain sailing, I was always seen as the best player in the schoolboys. I was guaranteed a YTS. And then um, John Lyle got sacked as manager and George Burley comes in just when we were now going to go into the youth team. And he was like, I don't care if kieran has been given a, a verbal agreement I need to see him play before. So I had to go on like a month's troll to try to prove myself. And I was just like, and at this stage is that I was probably about four foot two and everyone was now growing into like five foot 11, six foot men. And I was still a midget. And obviously everyone was talking about my, worrying about my size. Um, and I can remember we played Arsenal. I had to play for, so I was an under 16, but I had to play for Ipswich youth team against the Arsenal youth team and um, I had the game of my life and George Burley didn't even come to watch oh. so I'm thinking for fuck's sake um, no phones then. and then the next game we played at the training ground it was against Peterborough under 18s and then I scored in the first 10-15 minutes and they take me off after about 25 minutes and I'm thinking what Are they? they're just playing with my emotions yeah. here now and that was just so he could tell me, look, I've seen enough. You're welcome to the club. And then the rest is history. Um, probably the only time then in your career where you didn't know if you would make it or not, maybe. Yeah, probably that was the only time I had any doubts of like, wow. For the club to verbally agree something with me and then to backpedal on yeah. it was... That's like, not a right thing to do. But. With with uh, Craig Bellamy, like when we spoke to Craig about his time at Norwich and then he got, kind of went astray, went back to Cardiff. He was like unsure if he'd ever make it and stuff. It was times, but it seems with you, like he was the poster boy for Ipswich. He was plain sailing. That's yeah, what it's yeah, all yeah. to me. It was. Like I said, it was only when George Burley comes in for that initial, to give me a month period, was like... That was to put a rocket up your ass, I think. No, no. He was, listen... At the end of the day, he he came from Bobby Robson. He was in the youth team at Ipswich. Bobby Robson gave his debut. One thing you can say about George Burley, he gives kids their chances. Okay. He's, he he give Gareth South uh, Gareth Bailey's uh, debut, me's debut, Titus's debut, Tom Huddleston his debut, 
Adam Lalana, his debut, he loves promoting the youth. And if you're a manager of a football club, you want to run the football club however you want to see. So if he wants a youth team, he wants to have people that he want in that youth team to represent, represent his brand. And he hadn't seen me play. And like I said, I think it's wrong because I, I'd verbally agreed. I should have... No, and now you'd get that in writing, but back in the day it was. Yeah. But yeah, it's good to sometimes prove people mm. wrong. So, um, how did I you? Him wrong. How did you take that? You know, that first couple of years at Ipswich before you signed to Newcastle. What kind of football was you then? Yeah, I, it was just. They always say, a footballer's career is when you're young. It should be looking like that. Mine was like that. It was only when I probably played for England and made it that I started to have that. But for a young lad to just go like that was like, so I was still a youth player when I made my debut. I made my debut just on Boxing Day. But then my first full season as a pro, um, I got into the PFA Team of the Year. Uh, I got played for England under 21s. I went to the England Under-20 World Cup in Malaysia. Um, Michael Owen was in the team. Carragher was in the team. Uh, was probably our standout player in the tournament. Um, uh, and I got named in the PFA team of the year because I started off that season playing right back because our right back, Gus Unlinbeek, got injured. So I played a whole season at right back. So I wow. was flying with that. Then my second season, my last season at Ipswich, so I was only there for two and a half years, I again get in the PFA team of the year. I got voted by all the managers, the best player in the league. Craig came third. Yeah. <laughs> Did he? Bellis come third, so yeah, unlucky Bellis. Um, Was that the win? No. Did he ever win here? He, like I said, he stayed in the championship a season after I left, so uh, probably when yeah. I left. <laughs> so, yeah, he got that, Craig. So, so uh, who was the Premier League player who voted you? No, so it was all the... So we were in the... Obviously, Ipswich and, um, Ipswich and Norwich were still in the championship. So Division one yeah, at the time. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so for your fellow managers and the captains of the teams to vote you as the best player in the whole league... I played for England B that season. Uh, it was the game when Chris Sutton famously declined to play in. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Hoddle pull, uh, promoted me to the England squad, so I was still wow. a championship player. Wow. And I was in the England squad, and I was going to make my debut against France at Wembley, and it was the, the week that he came up with that uh, about the disabled kids. They must have done something wrong in a wow, previous yeah, yeah. life. He gets sacked, and then... Howard Wilkinson comes in. So I didn't get to make my debut, but still a championship player. Um, a championship player to be in the England squad with the Premier League. It kind of gives you even more, oh, I can't, I am ready for the Premier League. And again, um, I get in the PFA team of the year where you vote by your fellow players, but this time as a centre midfielder. So... Don't know how many people have been voted in the team in the year right back and then centre midfield as well. So, um, yeah, like I said, my early years at Ipswich was just, there was not one. Obviously, I I, I had a, a small fracture in my non-weight bearing bone, which kept me out for six weeks. But other than that, it was just flying. And literally, because we had Richard Wright at the time, he went on to play, he was a goalie, he went on to play for England. It was funny, so when we ever used to come out and you look out in the director's box, it was like a who's who of Premier League scouts wow. come to watch us all. So, yeah. Um, was there any clubs that you had your eyes set on at that time? So, the obviously, that, that last season at Ipswich, uh, I, I meet George and David Sheepshanks, the chairman and say that it, I'd like the opportunity to speak to clubs um, it was funny that I was on holiday I got left a message from Ruth Huller on my phone 
saying um, we'd really love to um, sign you. Harry Redknapp left a message um, to uh, sign me. I met David O'Leary's uh, chief scout who was at Leeds. Ian Bloomfield or Broomfield, I think it was. Um, they were really keen because they were buying all young, young British players. players as well. And Steve Rowley, who's passed away, he was a legendary Arsenal scout. Um, he come and watched all my games. But they, so when I played for England under 21s and England B, I played as like a right wing back. And I had that first season. So they see me as a, they, Arsene Wenger see me as a right back. They ended up buying Lauren, Lauren in the end. Um, Lauren, what a player. Yeah. So um, I thought I was going to go to Leeds or Arsenal. Um, the Arsenal one, because I preferred to play midfield. So the Arsenal one kind of, that put a span in the works that they see me as a right back. But, like you said, Leeds were buying all the British players. Lee Bowie was there. Woody was there. Uh, they eventually Danny bought Mills. Robbie Keane, Rio Ferdinand. They were Seth Johnson. So they were going really big. Um, Ferdinand, Viduka, Fowler. They had a brilliant team, didn't they? But I literally can remember coming back from holiday, went into George Burley's office. He said, look, we're not letting you go until we get the right offer. Uh, there's been a few bids, but... Nothing that's going to make us bite. So just get your head down and train. Went to train that morning, came back in the afternoon. He just said, we've accepted a bid from Newcastle. Meet your agent at Stansted and he'll get you a flight up to Newcastle. And um, if I would have known what I know now and have the knowledge that I would have known, I'd have waited to see if other clubs or just said, Listen, it worked out well for me because Newcastle, we play Champions League. But if I really wanted to, the way, the more I see it is I should have gone to Arsenal. <laughs> Knowing what you know now and they had the invincible team and we could have had Ashley Cole at left back and me at right back. and it's, But you can't have no regrets because like I said, I went to Newcastle, I set the ground. I set the ground up straight flying and like I said we had a really good team in the end it was just um, I wasn't expecting Newcastle I was expecting Leeds and Arsenal and that's the that's just me being honest so Newcastle United it's a great club it's, it's a massive club you know how did the fans take you at the beginning yeah it went perfectly uh, I think I won player of the month the first two months of the season um we were struggling as a team because obviously Rude Huller and Shearer, Rob Lee had been bombed out. He hadn't got a number. There was a lot of politics going on. Um, but me personally, individually, I was the, the, the shining light and everything was going <clears throat> really well. Um, and I loved it. And again, like you said, I'm a 20-year-old boy and you've got probably the best nightlife and you've got all this money now and wealth coming and um, the only, the only, the only probably thing if I'd have known that would have done differently, I'd have moved my mum and sister up with me uh, just to keep me on the straight and narrow. But um, To keep you on the straight and yeah, narrow? Yeah, because at the time, now clubs, they have that, they have these safeguarding officers and welfare officers and people like that to tell you where to live and to tell you where not to go and stuff like that. I was just <laughs> just finding out. Yeah, about finding the city. Yeah. yeah. So um yeah. What was yeah, what 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 was the adjustment like from, you know, little lip switch, you know, on the coast uh, you know, moving up to Newcastle, which is like you said, I think like the ratio's four to one, is it with the women to the men up there? It's it's something crazy, you know. It just, it wasn't just about the nightlife and the women. It was just that the Geordies, football is their life. It's just, everybody just wants a piece of you and they just care so much about the football club and care so much about their players. And I remember the 
the derby when Rude Hullock got sacked and I scored and I was living down in the quayside at the time. And I wasn't going out and that, I was just going to a restaurant. And I can remember just walking down the hill, go to a restaurant and this taxi just skids. The taxi driver's trying to drag me into the taxi. How dare you show your face out here? I'm just like, look, mate, I'm not going... I, I'm new to this. It's like five games in. I'm just going to get something to eat. How dare you get your fucking ass home and don't you show your face? And I'm just like, this is fanatical. Like, it was just a proper wake up call. Like, like Ipswich, it, sure. I thought is a decent sized club because of the Bobby and we've had Sir Alf Ramsey and we've won the league and we've won the FA Cup. But that was just a fanatical. Like, it's. It's their life and even though it ended in a bad way with me, that's why I'm so happy for this takeover and I just generally hope they have success, some success. Because you know what way. it means to them. Because I just know what it means to to each and every one of them fans. It, it, it's just mad. It is absolutely mad. You've had a lot of like ups and downs there. Mm. What was probably the highest point, you know, of your career at Newcastle? Ooh. I think, obviously, that Champions League campaign, um, when we lost the first three league, league games in the qualifying group and then we win the next three and Craig scores the last minute goal at um, Feyenoord. That was the ice and that was awesome because... Even though we had a good team, if you look at our team, I wouldn't say we really had any world-class players. Shearer was at the end, if you know what I mean. Not, yeah, he was not in his peak. He was a world-class goal scorer, but he wasn't the Shearer who was rapid, who could run corner flags, and and then you just had some very good players, and Craig, and me, and Jermaine Genus, and Lauren Robert, and Nobby Solana, and Gary Speed, and. Even if you look at our back four, it's crazy the thing. And there's no disrespect to the back four of me saying they're not great, but we had a back four of Aaron Hughes at right back with maybe Andy Griffin who could play right back, Nickus Dabizas with Titus Bramble and Andy O'Brien at the back. And our left backs were Olivia Bernard and Robbie Elliott. But Olivia. here we are, we're coming third and fourth in the leagues and going on this unbelievable cup runs and... Champions League runs and you go and how is that possible without any world class players and but that's where Bobby came into it where he just got the best out of everyone it's great it's just he made everyone feel they were the best player in the world so if you go onto the pitch with confidence you're always going to have a chance and that was one of the big things with England is that there was so much fear and dread and no one playing to their confidence. There's no coincidence we weren't getting the results that the squad should have been getting. But now you look at Gareth and how he's leadership and how he's brought the whole country together and how the players are just absolutely on top of their game. We've got to what? Semi-final and a final. So it's great. You put that down to like male management with Bobby Robson and the way Southgate is now. S someone like Sven Goran Eriksson, someone like that weren't really as personal to each player, would you say then? 100%. Um, yeah, obviously, I want to be a coach or a manager or you're still trying to find out and you always think to yourself, what is the most important thing? And I do think tactics and the coaching has improved massively since probably we were playing. But when I look at these top, top managers, they just had this, like you, we talked about Liverpool and Klopp and that. Every player would die for the... He gets 110% out of every player. Like James, like James Milner still comes in and just fits in like a glove, playing unbelievable. And I don't even think that's got to do with coaching or tactics. It's just... Every player feels amazing. And like you said, 
I've spoke to Gareth. Gareth's presented to me on some of my um, courses of coaching. And he's one of the first to admit that he's still got a long way to go to be a top, top coach. But there's a difference between a, a top coach and a top manager. And he is a top manager and a leader. And it was the same with Sir Bobby. And yeah. you can go through all the really successful managers and they've all got that ability to get the best out of someone. So Alex Ferguson, he used to always change his coaches to keep up to date, up to date with the times and uh, different tactics and that, but his man management skills were on a different planet. So there is a massive distinction between the two. Yeah. So, you know, like we said, there were so many things that were written in the paper about you, uh, which obviously led you to leaving Newcastle. What were one of the first things that you remember where the, where the fans of Newcastle kind of turned on you? Uh, I'd always have... I, I always had a love-hate kind of relationship. Not me they had a love kind of hate relationship with me and it was just, and I might be reading this wrong, but I could be playing really well, but as soon as I have a bad game, I'd be the first one to kind of get it kind of thing. Um, and I feel that was more to do with maybe, like you said, the off the pitch, the stuff, they probably, I was out on the key side, uh, people say my body language on the pitch is is bad. Um, and one thing I used to hate is that we just mentioned James Milner. James Milner is like the poster boy of hard work and high intense running and this and that when um, the Prozone stats first came out. And one of the things that got labelled to me is I don't care. But in my time at Newcastle, I was in the top two at running every single game. Distance covered, high intense running, sprint distance, everything. Top two all the time. First, second, never dropped out of it. And I always used to get labelled as, he don't care, he's lazy, and, you know? And it's just, and I always think, again, is it body language or is it because of, like you said, because they see me out on the... Keyside, having a good time. They see me driving, what was it? The papers labelled me, the King baby Bentley, baby Bentley, yeah. The baby King Bentley. Of, that was the baby Bentley brigade. I was the ringleader of that. I was the ringleader of the King of Bling. And obviously at the time, and this is not the fans, this was from the press, the King of Bling and all that, but the King of Bling, the more I think about it is that David Beckham had more watches than me and had more jewelry yeah. than me. Even a Stephen Gerrard and Lamps or a Wayne Rooney. But you labelled me King of, Black, Bling, King of Bling. I think there was some racial, racial element, a hundred percent. Obviously, we, yeah, all that type of stuff. Yeah, we did. We didn't. I didn't think much of it. I did the day because I had that well, fuck you attitude. But the more I think about it, is that. There was definitely some racial element. element to it, and it was just, it is what it is. And yeah. was that national or was that local? That was national. That was national. It was everywhere I went. It was the King of Bling, King of Bling, Baby Bentley, and I was just like, "Am I the only Person footballer to... who has a diamond watch?" Um, yeah, hundred percent. There was a. Racist, there was some racist agenda going on there, which I wasn't aware of. Um, but even looking back to some of the jewelry I wore and the diamonds, it, do, it does make me cringe. Like, you look at me now, no, the only ring I've got is my wedding ring. No, I've obviously got some watches that I keep. Sold them or what? No, I've got a couple of watches uh, that I keep, but. Jewelry and that doesn't do nothing for me. But at the time, we, it, it, I earn my money. If I want to yeah, spend my money, I'll spend my money. But they made a big thing of it with yeah. me, which is 
it was wrong. Um, they wouldn't be able to get away with it in today, the way the world's going. No, exactly. But they could get away with it then, so. Um, you was tied up in a rape case up there as well, wasn't you? Was you like one of the one of the main suspects? That was probably the biggest nightmare scenario um, other than when I let Bobby Robson down. So um, we played Arsenal on a Friday night. They used to have them stupid Friday night Sky games. So we're thinking, buzzing, weekend in London or well, we've definitely got the weekend off. The gaffer said we can go out, stay down. Um, and um, that was probably the only time I got the better of Ashley Cole as well playing against Ashley. We lost 3-2, but I had two assists. And um, I was meeting a a, a, a friend, a, a lady, she was a female friend, and I was going to chill with her. Um, she had a flat in London, um, but she forgot the keys or something along them lines. So I met her and her brother in the players lounge after the game and she was like I've left my key I was like don't worry um, I'll get a hotel and we'll meet up with my agent we'll go for a drink take it from there she was like yeah okay so um, I've gone to uh, the Grosvenor House Hotel booked my room um, checking in and then my agent was now picking me and her up so I mean when I'm in the restaurant Titus rings me up and says um where are you? I said, uh, I'm staying in the grown house. He said, have they got rooms? I said, of course they've got rooms. He said, um, just use your credit card and save a couple of rooms. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I saved a couple of rooms. Didn't think nothing of it. Um, I went out um, with this uh, girl, and my agent, I had a good night. I can remember getting papped as I was going into a club. I had this... Hip hop is not dead t shirt on or something. <laughs> dead press thing. And um didn't think enough of her of her. So Saturday morning, said goodbye to the girl, uh took her to a tube or something. And then I met up with Titus and I said, How was your night? Yeah, yeah. We had a few girls, da 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 da. So then after the weekend, so on the Saturday, then we meet Rio Ferdinand, he came out with us, uh David Beckham's sister, Joanne Beckham, who we all knew quite well, she came out. So we had a real good, well, I had a real good weekend. So then it was Monday morning and obviously the papers must come out late Sunday or something. So it was early Monday morning. I was now going to training. So I was living in Durham at the time. Um, and I got a phone call from my agent. He was like, have you seen the paper? And I said, no. She said, it's a... It's a Sun article and um, they're saying about a rape case and roasting and he said, what did you do Saturday? I said, I was with Rio and um, Joanne Beckham. He said, were you with any birds? I said, no, no, like, just Joanne Beckham and her mates. And So I don't know who that could be. London's a big place. So I didn't think nothing of it. So um, we've come into training and the press outside the training ground, so I'm like, something's going on here. So um, Bobby Robson calls a meeting together and um, he was like, has anyone seen the paper? Has anyone got anything to say? So no one was like, no. And he was like, did you have a good weekend? And he points to me. So I was like, yeah, it was all right. And he's like, you sure it's nothing to do with you? I was like, no. And then he goes to Shola Amiobi. Shola wasn't even in London. And he went, did you have a good weekend in London? And Shola was like, I weren't even in London. So he was like, look, does anyone know what this is about? So Titus puts his hand up and says, yeah, I think I know what it's about, but there was no rape. There was two of us who um, ended up with this girl. Not seeing your children or at a tight legal spot, Neil McAvoy Law can help. We don't give legal advice, but we know good people who do. 
So if you want somebody on your side, giving it 100%, get in touch. Quote the Central Podcast for discounts and we will be on your side. The Ochenbauer. Do you need a work uniform? Want to start a clothing brand? Or maybe you have a football kit that needs a logo printed? Well, if I was you, I'd get in touch with the Reinspire Printing Company down to Forest Industrial Estate for the finest printing and embroidery in Wales. I use them for my custom-made mankini, but you could use them for T-shirts, hats, hoodies, and many, many other things. Bobby's gone into one. What the fuck? And da 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 da. This is a joke and that. And then obviously Craig being opinionated was like, whoa, 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 hold on a minute here. Like this is sensitive material. You're already like the papers gaffer. Like you're already going mad. You ain't even heard Titus's side of the story. Titus has just said this fucking there's more to the story than that and there was no rape and no rape or whatever so anyway i think the gaffer's like yeah fair point let's go out to train so we've gone training we've gone training there's press everywhere and then um he's called us back in after training he's like everyone back in he was like right titus has put his hand up are you sure anyone else is not involved so um, everyone's just sitting there and he was like well your name's being mentioned to me um, by the police and and you too Shola and Shola's we're all just laughing now by this stage I'm like I was on a date and Shola wasn't even in like Newcastle what what the hell he was like, well, I'm just telling you what there's been said. And I, I said, well, I'm just telling you, I was nowhere near the scene or or anywhere of what happened. So um, obviously I've trained and finished, phones blowing up from agent, what the hell's going on, da, 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 da. The next stage in the paper, the next day in the paper, it said England star, in rape case and it had the picture of me in the hip hop is dead and it just pixeled out my face so everybody could recognize me so like my ex at the time who, who i've got my children with uh was saying you're a fucking disgrace and you've got fucking family members saying you'll put sh-. and i'm thinking i'm not even there so um as this as it was going on the The police wanted to obviously interview Titus, but they wanted to interview me as a witness because I was with them on the Saturday. So obviously this happened on the Friday, on the Saturday when we were out with Rio and uh, Thing. So um, they said they wanted to interview me as a witness. And I was like, okay, no problem. Because like they were saying, if I would have gone into like a Titus's room... I'd have to, during the weekend, I'd have to tell them where I've touched and stuff like that, just in case of... So I was like, yeah, no problem. And I knew something was wrong. So when I've gone to the interview process, um, I'm with my solicitor. Charlie Woods took me as me and my solicitor. And there was a female uh, and a male... And they, they press the tape and say, this is 6.05 in the evening and the interview process with Kieran da, 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 da. And the first question she asked me, and I remember I'm just a witness, was, have you ever had anal sex? I need, I, I can remember I must have had a, <laughs> I must have had a glass of water. <laughs> she must have said, have you had anal sex? And I literally went, <laughs> and like, like, my solicitor was like, how, di- like, what the hell? Yeah, like, isn't it? That, so, and I just thought, do they, like, uh, do they think there's some cover? Like, I just, <laughs> so then, obviously, because I had to tell them um, that I'd been on a date with a girl and uh, Joanne Beckham was out on the Saturday, then they all got interviewed as well. Oh, it was just absolutely mess. carnage. But so, What they said to me was, is that while this is a criminal investigation, I couldn't release a statement. So I had the whole country thinking that I was part of this massive 
what was it, roasting scandal when I wasn't even there. And we played Middlesbrough away on the Saturday. And I can remember as soon as I touched the ball, every single one of their fans was singing, who's the rapist on the wing? And I was just like, I can remember after the game saying, like, I even was taken out on tight, like, and like, poor Titus is not, and I was like, fucking, it's got nothing to like, fucking, da 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 da, and like, and like, like Titus was, he, he didn't rape no one, he didn't even go to the part. You know where I wanted to lash out at people because I couldn't even defend myself. Um, but yeah, um, the truth eventually, I, I, eventually put out a statement. I sued all the papers, every single one of the papers, because they wrongly oh, accused me. Okay. But the damage had already been done. Like you said, you're you're talking about a thing with me when I wasn't even, even there. In there yeah, I yeah, wasn't yeah. even there. But again though, you know, you you, you bring in Titus Titus Brown, Bulky and Dyer, Shola Amiobi wasn't even there. That's like another form of racism I would put. You know, I just uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny when you look back now. Yeah, it's yeah. like, why didn't he bring Bellamy in? <laughs> yeah, I don't it's know. mad. Yeah, uh, there's been loads with Newcastle. I know probably everyone you interview goes on about the Lee Bow your case. Mm -hmm. You know, what's yeah. your relationship like with Lee? Very good. Yeah. Um, Lee's a great guy. Again, we're talking about racism. Obviously, what happened with the the case in Leeds with him and Jonathan Woodgate. Yes. Uh, there was a lot of racial te racial tension kind of brewing up at that case and a lot of people always think Lee Bow is a racist. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the guy. Um, he shocked the shit out of me that he's a manager. Like yeah. probably... Probably when me and Craig say we're coaches and that, he's probably going, fuck off. Because you just never would have pictured us three go. Well, you, you could picture Craig, but you couldn't picture me and Bo. But um, I've always liked Bo. He, he fitted in really well. Um, it's just unfortunate that, a bit like, like you said, your mate Craig, they have a real fire when they're on that football pitch and... Sometimes that spills over and, yeah, what I said was a bit out of order and for him to lose it like that on the pitch still does shock me a bit. But it's probably, like you said, we've probably, he's played for England and I've played for England. We're, we're probably both most remembered for a fight on the football sad. pitch. It's, yeah. It's sad, really, where we probably underperformed in our careers that everyone wants to talk about that fight. Um, but... There's no ill feelings. Uh, he rang me up after the after the game and we hashed it out and it got to the stage where I felt really sorry for him because the police up in Newcastle, they tried to get me to press charges. They tried to make it a big case. They really wanted him done and you know, just basically piss off. Yeah. At the time, you could imagine, I'm thinking, what the fuck? I just can't. All I can't remember thinking is, I cannot believe he's throwing punches at me in front of 52,000 people. But but that's the passion, and he's like that. He, these players, they play on the edge, the Craigs, the Joey Bartons, the, the Lee Bowyers, and sometimes it's spill over. But you'd rather that kind of passion where it... On, with an edge, yeah. then someone who doesn't give a shit. That's just my personal take on it. Yeah. We speak about Middlesbrough, you know, calling you a rapist on the wing and stuff. That's one <laughs> thing. Another thing is when your own crowd boo you, when your own football club boo at you. Was that one of the final straws in Newcastle? Uh, no, so when they first booed me, it wasn't because I deserved it. So obviously with the Bobby Robson, I refused to play on the right wing. Uh, we just signed Patrick Cliver. We just signed James Milner. We just signed uh, Nicky Butt. There's no excuses. So competition was red hot. And um, 
I wanted to play centre midfield that season. Uh, I was competing against Jermaine Genus, Nicky Butt, um, and I had a very, I've, I had a very good pre-season. Um, so when the team was announced and I was on the right wing, obviously the friendly before when we played Rangers, Craig said he didn't want to play left wing, kicked up a fuss. I know the fans want Patrick Cliver and Shearer. I'm not playing on the left wing. And they were arguing for about 15 minutes and the buzzer was going off for half time and there was still no, nothing was decided. So I just said, fuck it. I'll play on the left wing. <laughs> and then you lot will sort this after the game. We've got to go out and play. So I'd gone and helped the club, helped the manager, helped my mate Craig, played the game. And um, after the game, I thought the ship was going to hit the fan. Nothing was said. So in my head again, I'm thinking, oh, okay, cool. I, I don't want Craig to get in trouble. So, and obviously we won the game and next game of the season's the season starts for proper. So then when I'm put on the right wing, it was more a stubborn thing. It was a game we're touching when we get to my early childhood, but I had this fuck, hang on a minute. Players are allowed to pick and choose when they want to play. And I've said to you, I want to play sitting with Phil, but because I'm some mug and some fool guy, and again, I'm wrong, by the way. I'm not trying to reason, but this is how my mindset's thinking. Mindset's it's just going, oh, yeah. fucking taking the fucking piss. And this is the manager who wasn't just the manager to me. It was like, we had a deeper connection. Like, no one, not Shearer, not Craig. I ask, ask everyone, ask J. Main Genesis. Our relationship wasn't like a manager and a a manager and a player. It was like family members. The way we spoke... The way I spoke to Bobby and he spoke to me, that you you wouldn't. It's very un, unique. You'd ever see that in a in a in a football club. So, so at this stage, I was just like, "You've just signed James Milner. Um, he's a right winger. Um, play him, and I'll bide my time, and I'll force my way into the team in the centre midfield." and yeah, come on, son. <laughs> yeah, he does. Come on, son. Have a think about it. We need you. And by this time, my stubborn head had gone. And um, we played Middlesbrough. I come on after about 60 minutes. He brings me on at right wing. <laughs> I just like, you can't make this up. He brings me on at right wing. And then Zenden's playing left wing. Zenden goes down the line. I slip. They cross. We can see the last minute goal for them to equalise. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, when it rains, it definitely yeah, pours. Yeah. So then um, we're in the change room after the game. My head is scrambled now by this thing. Just more that I've let you the team pound, down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I still was in my, I was still in my, the way my mind was thinking at that time was, was, I'm in the right. I'm in the right. But obviously I was devastated because I like to win and I don't want us to, to draw. And we had a good team and we were hoping to compete for the Champions League again. So so then he goes to do his press conference. And this again, this is when you're talking about a manager. And he's gone to do his press and they must go, we know Kieran refused to play right wing in the press conference and that. And he's lied and protected me. So he comes out in the change room and he goes, son, they've, they've got the story, but don't worry, I've protected you and that. <laughs> and I'm just like, talk about making you feel even worse that, hang on a minute, I've just <laughs> let you down. I've just let you down and then you're still protecting me. It's just like, that's just a special, unique individual. It's just scary to think. No, most managers would just absolutely, Leave like, you I've to had drive. soon as soon as we'd just say, he's a discreet, da, 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 but he protected me. And I was just like, wow. Um, so 
after the game is when they have that stupid friendly, England friendly, um, straight up, literally first game into a new season. So I met up with England. And where's the England game? Wembley was under reconstruction, St. James's James. Park. And I come on at half time um, and the whole crowd booed. Every single fan booed. Um, so then I can remember Freddie Shepherd and Bobby were at the game and they were like, wow, like, um, this is mad. So then we played Tottenham at home and I was on the bench and we lost. So we didn't start off to a great season. We didn't start off really well. And I come on for like the last 20 minutes again. Got booed to hell. Um, and like I said, I'm not, I should, they had every right to boo me, but they, it was just, I, I was still thinking what I did was right because I was an immature, didn't get the help that I needed at the time. And, and that was the game we played. So then J Jermaine Genus got injured against Tottenham and uh, we played Norwich at home. It was a night game and that was the only time in my career that I wanted to be substituted. I tried so hard and was getting booed so much that every time I tried something, it was like my left foot was my right. It was yeah. just, and I can remember when my number came up to get subbed, the whole place just erupted like we scored a goal. Like It was that I, intense. It was honestly, and I can remember going into the bath, so it was a night game, so the game would have finished at 7.45, 8.45, around about 9.40. And I sat in the bath afterwards to about 11.30 at night, and it was just me in the change room while I fought, and there was two physios, Derek Wright, Big Derek, and Paul Ferris, and they come, and they used to stay behind and have a fears, and they were like, have a beer. And I was just like, I can't, it can't surely it's got to get better and they were like Pfft. they couldn't even reassure me so um, we only drew that game two all Craig scored two against his old club but then the pressure was mounting on Bobby and then we played Aston Villa away and he comes and pulls me and he says I'm going to leave you out of the squad altogether and I'm like you should have been leaving me out of the home games <laughs> Away, yeah, well, yeah. away fans, there's less fans, but away fans are usually good. Cool. And this is a game that you'd need to win. Um, but again, he wanted to protect me, take me out of the firing line up, and then we ended up losing. He, he left out Shearer, he dropped Shearer. Uh, played Patrick and Craig. We played really well that day. I can remember watching from the director's box. I think we were going 1 0 up early. And we ended up losing and then Bobby lost his job. So that was always on my conscience. And when he had to say his goodbyes and that, I just hugged him. And, you know, when you just don't want to let go, it was pretty brutal, to be honest, that I had to live with that. And at the time, <laughs> I couldn't come out and give my reasons why. Listen, again, I could have a hundred million reasons. If a manager asks you to play for a football club, you play for a football club. Then you have your beef afterwards. But I didn't want to come out with my side of the story because Craig would have got it. In the, <laughs> Craig would have got it. So I was protecting my friend as well, even though it was killing me even more. I didn't want Craig to go down that same path as well. So, um, so when you said, was that the, the final straw? That wasn't because... Like you said, Obviously, so I deserved it. Then I won them back over with my performances. Soon as comes in and I played some great football. I won them back over. And then um, then the Lee Bowyer thing happened. And I thought, here we go. I'm going to go back to square one. Um, and they were good as gold for me. And it was my final season. So... I was injured for the first couple of months of the season and um, we were bottom of the league. And my first game back... Sorry, is Craig gone by now? Yeah, Craig's gone. Craig's, Craig's, 
Craig, Didn't stick around Craig long didn't enough. last long with Gray and Seamus. Seamus that yeah. was just uh, that was just never going to happen. Yeah. And um, I literally came back into the team. The first game was at Emirates. I scored on my comeback game, and and I'm not being big headed when I say this, but. Newcastle would have been relegated that year if it wasn't for me, Oberfemme Martins and Scott Parker. So we we kept up and we played the last game of the season and it was against Watford and we were warming up by our fans and the fans didn't really take a shine to Stephen Carr, who was our fullback at the time. And they went through, we were doing a warm-up and they sung every player's name except for me and Stephen Carr. And I just thought, you know what, they're tired of me. They're done with me. Like, And I ended up scoring in that game as well. I scored to put us 1-0 up and I didn't even celebrate. I was just like, yeah. They're bored of me. Um, whatever I do is never going to be good enough. Um, and again, like I said, I didn't blame the the fans because, like you said, I I did let them down on numerous occasions. But this My is when I was feeling. this is when I was maturing as a player, as a person, and they probably would have seen the best of me, but. Like you said, at that time, Craig had left, Jermaine Genius had left. Maybe it was my time to leave. And yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I left were, that season. Yeah, it's, you know, your career has been unbelievable. And, you know, you probably, people would want just that bit extra. Mm -hmm. It's more the fans, you know, more the yeah, people who actually you. watch you. They're like, oh, I just wish Kieran done this mm. and... It is what it is, you know, but, you know, you've had an unbelievable career, especially with international level as well. You know, you know you've know, you captured your country, um, major tournaments. Mm. Um, I want to go into a bit of, of, of when you come out of your career then. Like, yeah. So so did you, was you always thinking about writing a book or was this something that was just, some, you know, the next career move for you? No, so I was... It was, my book came again, we keep mentioning Craig. It was, Craig had his book launch. Uh, Good fella. We know Oliver Holt, the journalist. Oliver Holt was always one of the journalists that was very fair, I thought. And that, he used to give me stick. But him and Henry Winter, I thought it wasn't just vicious for the sake of being vicious. It was, if I needed a slap on the wrist, it was great reporting, or if I was doing well, there was always... So I always had a mutual respect for Oliver Holt. So when he, Craig did his book and he had his book launch at Cardiff, um, he asked me to come down, um, come down for it. So I came down for it. And the night before I was reading his book and... Uh, <laughs> Oliver Holt was saying, what do you think? And he was like, because Oliver Holt was loving his book and um, he was saying I was just loved his honesty. And I was like, honesty, you think that's a watered down version? <laughs> <laughs> so I know. <laughs> so yeah, he was like, that's watered down. I said, well, hey, I get what you mean with his honesty. And a lot of footballers do their autobiography and Craig was still playing. So I said that a lot of players do their autobiographies when they're playing, so they have to say the the correct things and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. So I said, so when I say it's watered down, it's just like it's best when um, there's no ties attached. There's no exactly. So um, he always he always was like every time he was like, so when are we going to do this thing? And he got me to meet some uh, some book book publishers and um. Like you said, I was, when I retired, I had a year of going to boxing events and just finding out what I really wanted to do, dabbling in a bit of TV, dabbling in a bit of coaching, but didn't really have anything, just wanted to see where it would take, take me. Yeah. Obviously, I did the, the, jung the jungle as well. I'm a celebrity. Um, 
and then that was yeah Oliver Holt just said I think it's the time best time to do the book um, and I agreed and yeah. um, the book was well received and obviously um, I opened um, a few people's eyes up to a few of the chapters in it um, but yeah it was from the heart it was honest and um, yeah yeah it was quite therapeutic doing it so obviously one of the one of the chapters, one of the biggest things in there was you opening up about your childhood. It's it's quite weird going back to it now because we've just gone about your career and it would have been nice to have, you know, picked things out in your career which you've done knowing this. But I thought we'd just talk about it the way it came out. And, mm. and that's your um the, the abuse you, you had as a childhood. Can you go into it in any way? Can you explain to us how it happened and you know how yeah, you dealt so, with it? So um my mum used to work at like a Tooks, which was a bakery. So she always used to work really late on the Fridays and I always used to stay around my nan's, uh, my nana's um, on a Friday night. I used to be, always be at my nana's, to be honest. Um, and she used to live with her brother, Kenny, who was the, the one who abused me. Um, and I'll never forget, I used to, I used to have a thing with denim jeans. So if my mom or aunts or dads or nans or anyone used to have like a denim jeans, it was like the feel on my cheek. I used to like Love like put my head down on their lap and out for the count. And I can remember it was me and my uncle, great uncle. We were watching TV. Um, he had some jeans on and I fell asleep on his uh, lap and then next thing I'm awake and petrified to open my eyes because he's obviously fondling me down below. Um, and then it just seems like it's going on eternity and I finally shift up and trying to stop and he kept trying to shush me and um, obviously I was keen into my chocolate sweets and he was like, if you just let me finish what you're I'm doing, I'll buy you loads of sweets and give you loads of money and still going on. And um, obviously, eventually get him to stop. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to go to to bed now. Um, and I go straight out into my nan's landing. And I can remember my mum's house number back in the day. The number it was 214-576. And I can remember ringing her and I was going to tell her. So it's like literally it's ringing, it's ringing and you're like, pick up, pick up. And as soon as she picks up, he comes out of the door and just stands there like that going. So I was just like, mum, I was work. Can you come and get me in early in the morning? I don't want to be here. Um, and she's like, yeah, yeah. And then I remember going upstairs and my uncle my uncle, we call him Dewey. He's called Kieran as well, and he's in he's he's in bed with his girlfriend. Um, and I just go into his room and just start crying my eyes out. And I actually, they were the first two people I told. And he was like, "Don't worry, this will never happen to you again. Um, don't tell no one." Um, and when people read that kind of story in the book, I'm worried for my uncle because it was like he was trying to like protect, but it wasn't. It was because of my dad. Because he knows that if that were to come out, my dad would be doing a life stretch in prison. My dad would have just killed him. Yeah, just crushed his skull into the floor hundreds of times or... He would have done something so, um, but the scariest part of it was that because no one knew it happened, not the actual, what happened that night, but me going to my nan's and then being in that room with him on my own and he's then coming up to be going, hey, and like, it was just like after, mental torture. After so, that. Yeah, so like I'd have to, I, I couldn't keep saying I can't go to my nan. So 
I always tried to never be left in a room, but sometimes he would we'd always go outside my nan's back door and he'd always be in the kitchen where the back door is. So if I'm going out with my mates, he'd be there lingering. It was just, so that mental torture that went on for two or three years of not knowing when you're going to be isolated with him again and just like a sexual predator. It was just, it was horrible. And like you said, I'm not told no one. I didn't speak to my uncle Dewey and his wife. And I'm trying to process this. I used to get ridiculed by the family because I used to end up in my mum's bed, at the bottom of my mum's bed. I used to sneak in when she's asleep and curl up in a ball. And my family used to ridicule me saying, oh, you sleep with your mum and you're 14, 15. But it was just because if I woke up in the night, I was shitting myself that he could get me again. Um, Again, people used to ridicule me about my mood swings. Um, it It was absolutely, it was, like you said, for... Obviously, you'd think the actual sexual act would be the thing that was the most traumatic. It wasn't. It was the traumatic of not knowing when he could pounce at any time. Um, And like you said, for me to deal with this on my own and not tell anyone to play for your country to succeed, but unbeknown to me was all the traits that I was developing stubborn a fuck you attitude can't show weakness that was a big one I couldn't show weakness couldn't let strangers in I had real trust trust issues like my mates could bring a friend in who they've known for years and because I didn't know him he must have thought what a fucking obnoxious prick I was because I'd just be like "Mm." (laughs) I don't know I'm not let my guard down because the last time I let my guard down this is what happened to me so um, yeah it was a secret for for nearly 20 years of my life Um, and it was just by chance that um, it was just by chance that uh, QPR Joey Barton got this guy Peter Kay in from the Sport and Chance Clinic and he could tell something was not right with me and he kept probing and probing and then I let it out. Um, and I always respect him for that because he showed me the why I am as a person because I used to be hard on my younger son, my older son, but he was... So every time he showed vulnerability when he was 11, 12, I used to snap. Never hit my kids or never been a disrepair for him, but I used to be like, fucking man up in that. But obviously when I was 11 or 12 and I showed vulnerability, I was taken advantage of. He showed me... You don't want that, yes. He showed me so many things of, um, like you said, um, not showing weaknesses, eye contact. Um, and it, it helped me explain some of the the things in my life where I've never really let someone in 100%. The only people I'd say I'd let in 100% was family. Uh, and that fucked me. That, that got me fucked as well. So I even started questioning family members and wouldn't let anyone in. I was a loner. I'd like my own time. Um, that could be the life and soul of a party when I was in my element and my safety bubble. But as soon as I was out that, you couldn't get two words out of me. It was... Would you say a a Kieran Dyer before the abuse was a total different Kieran after the abuse started? So, again, even though he told me why I was the way, so obviously when I told my wife and uh, my family, so they'd snap it. So, like, I could... I, I fell out with... I didn't speak to my best mates for years and that just over something stupid where I couldn't be the first to apologize. Like I'm Still a weakness right. and stuff like it's crazy. Like, like we talked about this of Bobby Robson, like I'm not showing you can, I'm a weak 
Like, it's crazy. So just because he showed me, it helped me understand, I never really had a process because I didn't really go to any more people to get really help. So it was like my family, like my missus would say, oh, you're being stubborn again, snap out of it. But it's killing me to snap out of it, if you know what I mean. It's killing me. So I know the feeling. So I was, I was, I was an improved version but it wasn't until I met Ant and Foxy where they really changed my life. And like you said, they they know straight away something's up. And the way they... And it got to the stage that in the show it got edited, but I actually say they thank you for saving my life because I'm not a victim no more. Because if I'm a victim, then that fucking evil twat wins. If I hurt people by being stubborn or by not showing weakness and stuff, he's winning. They become victims. So that mindset is kind of helped me now where, yeah, I'm, like you said, if this Kieran Dyer would have been at, 17 now. Yeah. Start of my professional career. When you're talking about the underachieve, overachieve, I think we would have been saying I underachieved because I think that this clarity and this stage I'm in my life, I would have fulfilled my potential and I would have been spoke about in a lot higher light. So when I say that I overachieved, yes, I overachieved because a lot of people who deal with sexual abuse are... Gone. Homeless, fucking addicted to all sorts, fucking, they're, they're, yeah, like you said, they're a shell of their person. So for me to even achieve what I achieved, then I kind of pat myself in the back. Yeah, yeah. so you should, mate. Yeah. Just, just for the people out there, maybe, just for some sort of advice, maybe, how would you say a, a predator works? Like, is there signs there for people to know? I felt, well, so it was quite, since I've come out, there was a, another family member who has said that he approached and there was a, like a, gr a green where kids used to play and he used to spend a lot of time reading papers uh. down there and unnerving people. So there were signs out there, um, the one thing I will say about a sexual empower because after he'd done it and there was no repercussions, they become empowered. So like I said, by him waiting by the door, I think he got such a buzz of, of me walking by so he could grab me saying, let me just finish what it was just, just, yeah. Um, How old was he? Oh, so he's older than my mum and that. So if he's my nan's brother, he was a younger brother. So my nan's are in her eighties now. So he must be about seventy odd, seventy odd yeah, I'd say. Yeah. And even that, like, I had to go to the funeral because I was really close to my nan. And I'd go to his funeral and I had to put on this fucking Friends act, of act, and I kind of let my guard slip because one of my cousins. She goes to give me a tissue and I said, I ain't crying when over that fucking prick. You know what I mean? She kind of like, oh. Mm. When you say about the two shows you, you've been on, you know, since you've come out about this, the SAS helped you. The jungle was brilliant. You was brilliant in there. You came fourth place. Why do you think you choose these type of shows? Do you think it's to show what type of person you are, build your character or something? No, um... I did the jungle because um, my children at the time, even my, it was only my oldest, Kai, who would probably actually sim me anywhere near my peak of my powers when I was playing. Okay, all Caden and Cody see and, and, and Lexi, my daughter, all they see was football caused me pain and despair and injuries and crutches and operations. So they never got to see me at the peak of my powers. And with regards to 
The Jungle, it was a family show that we all watched and we all loved. It'd be and lush to see you on that. So I did that selfishly for them so they could be proud of their dad and have a have banter when I got out of me eating pig's balls or whatever, whatever the case mm. would be. But it was quite gratifying when I did the show that the amount of praise I got where people actually was like, oh, he's not actually a fucking dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> From what the, the tabloids yeah, have yeah, portrayed yeah, yeah, you yeah, as yeah. all them fucking years. Like I can remember when I turned on my phone, you can imagine how that, and that was Jonathan Woodgate. And he was like, I can have my mates of, and they were like they didn't expect that from you and it was that was kind of satisfying but I didn't do that for that I just did that solely for the kids and with regards to the SAS I did it because I'm competitive and I thought I could co complete the course easily and so when I'm seeing them on TV and I was like I'd piss that just <laughs> like, yeah that was how does that show work from the backside of it the show is the most hardest show. What you see on TV, so you sure. see an edited version that they should make the episodes two hours long to get a real, like, you wake up early, you get beasted for about an hour and a half, you then go and do your, you probably do three, three kind of challenges a day. And it's not just the challenges. You don't realise that sometimes we run like 5K with 30Ks on our bag through the terrain just to get to the challenge. And then if we piss Ant off, then he'd make you like dunk your head in, like get in, submerge yourself in the most icy cold water and run your asses back. And then at 11 o'clock at night before we go to bed, we get beasted again on the courtyard. I'm like... That's mad. It's scary. And what I found really hard is that if you do a mile run, you kind of know a finish line. They never tell you how far you're going to run. So they want to see people who people... So if you can do a kick finish at the end, they go fucking mental. Because as they say in their thing, if someone's chasing you with a gun, you can't pace yourself. You run... And you run as fast as you can. And if that, ta if that has to be 10 miles, you you'll find something from belief. So why are you pacing yourself? Like yeah. the whole mindset of it and some of the chat, it is just... Live or die, in it? I've just got nothing but respect for, like you said, Foxy, Billy and all of them. And, and they are... Who's the most toughest out of, one of, the, out of all them, do you think? Oh. Who's the one that scared you the most? Or intimidated? I wouldn't say, yeah. I wouldn't say scared. I would just... I know. <laughs> it was just the mutual... I just... All of them. They just all had... Equally the, savage. And people just see the screaming. This is what I'm saying. There's a method behind their madness. They're not just screaming just to be horrible. They're screaming to push buttons. They want to see you break. They want to see your weak side so they can help fix your weak side. Like, if they weren't, if it weren't for them probing the shit out of me and doing what they were doing, they would have never been able to help me with the, the sexual abuse and be proud and be a glass half full and... Fuck it. They're brilliant at what they do. Was it therapeutic for you? Not the challenges. <laughs> Coming out of it. Yeah, but when you go in and you speak to them, it was, it was just like... It was mind-blowing like i've seen that's what i'm saying i've seen psychiatrists and psychologists and spent sessions with them and sessions with them and then you spend a week with some sas guys and they probed and done more for you than the so-called experts um but they are hard motherfuckers man you look like a hard motherfucker with that beard. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is that, is that fire? Yeah. Fuck, you know. I that's... went hard when I collapsed on that towel with a punctured lung, though. I know, I know. Broken, yeah, I thought it was broken. No, I had a fractured rib, but I had, when I started collapsing, that was, yeah, my lung, 
Wow. You Can carried on. on. Tried to. Well, I didn't quit. But they had to drag me off the show. <sighs> Yo, you what I? Nah, Cole, bro. I'm not going to lie, I'm a bit itchy. What do you mean? Bro, I've been using that Bic razor, man. I think I've got an ingrown hair from it. Oh, for fuck's What should I do? This is for you and the fans sake You need to go cop up a manscape Comfy to toss like a pancake Cause now I don't look like a damn ape I used to be hairy, my family are Greek But now I am trimmed and my bits are on fleek Now I get nooky when under the sheets And the back of my balls don't shake for my cheeks I recklessly trim in the dark The ceramic blades are not sharp I dangerously shave in the night With the help of my LED lights I feel like a one in a million Wetting up girls like amphibians I am not into Brazilians Thank you manscape, you are brilliant and that's it, bruv, trust me. Yeah. Like, life changing. I used to always say, I'm a shower, not a grower, but now, thanks to the mower, my ting hangs lower. Yeah, Cole, what about the ball sweat, man? What do you mean? What, what about the sweat, bro? Sweaty sacks are not deserved, so I'm getting them slapped with crop preserve. Watch it down there, checking for bumps, make sure you're checking for lumps. Pebble dash when I trim my mustache, mow the lawn, then I'm gone in a flash. Used to shave, then I show in a rash, but my bick's gone straight in the trash. Nice one, Cole. You've really put me on there, bro. Not a problem, bro. But like I said, for you and the fans' sake, if you want to check out your manscape, then hit the discount code. All capital letters. Stay central. That's all bald writing, yeah? Like my balls. Stay central. You need to cop up a manscape. I've got a couple yeah. uh, questions here. Like, just have some people I want to mention before we go, but... There's one question that we all want to know. Um, we all want to know the answer to. And who's got the biggest cock out of you, Lampard and Ferdinand? I'm <laughs> 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 oh, oh, I thought no, I got it. away with that with the uh, Iron Apple stories. Uh... Oh, fuck. What happened? Who's, whose idea was it? Was it a sex tape set up or was this someone slyly set this up? No, so a bit when I'm in this tape, this is the truth of this thing is that, and I, again, when the papers portrayed us as, well, portrayed me as disrespecting this lady, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in bed with this girl and someone's got a key card and they've come in with the camera and literally they've come round and then obviously they're like filming and then obviously when me and her see them, we jump off each other and stop. So yes, she was disrespected that someone got the key card and came into the room, but I didn't secretly set up a camera and secretly film them. They made out that everyone had been secretly filmed without the girl's knowledge and it was, it was fucking... It was, but it was. It, listen, it was, it was wrong because you, you, again, I don't believe that England footballers should be role models. I think parents should be role models, and but the way they, the way they put it out there is that we secretly filmed these girls and degraded these girls, but. That wasn't right, the just case. Just a bunch of lads on tour, that really. Wasn't the case, yeah. You, just a bunch of lads that on tour. Happens in every room, and, and, but. Unfortunately, that's yeah. what happens with the football. I'm not. I'm not saying it's. Uh, no, yeah, what we of course. did was right. Um, and like I said, I'm now I've got a 21 year old boy and a, a boy soon to be 16, and they'll be going on holiday soon. And yeah. all you can do is just explain to him the the trials and tribulations of holiday, and hopefully they do the right thing. But lads will be lads. Without the Obvious. Oh, and by the way, I'm not the smallest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Lampard or Ferdinand, it goes in order. I reckon Ferdinand's a swinger as well. <laughs> I can't. I, 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 I can't comment. I've never watched the video. Then, so <laughs> just me. I just know that I must be up there. Yeah. What about you and Bellas? <laughs> <laughs> No, but small people like us, you'll be surprised, can't you? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Trust me, there'll be no surprises if you see Bellas. <laughs> Sorry, Craig. <laughs> um, look, we state the obvious, obviously, with you know, you've got this transplant um, you're waiting on now. Mm. Any moment. But how are you, yourself? 
you know, mentally. So, um, how are you feeling? It's just the fatigue. Um, so, like you said, I look well. I still go to use the, the gym and I still go for cycle rides and I still go for bike rides and I'm still doing work and doing the 23s and coaching. But there's times where, like it was only two nights ago, so I came in and it must have been about half six and I fell asleep on the settee around seven o'clock in the morning and then my missus was like, oh, it's nine o'clock. And I was like, she was like, do you want to watch some Ozark? And I said, no, nah, I'm going to go to bed. And then I woke up at 10 o'clock. So all the way through from, so basically from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock. So 15 hours sleep, just bang. I come home some afternoons and just sleep for like five, six hours. Yeah, but you're not doing nothing. You, like, because you've got nothing planned, you're going to feel tired. No, anyway. no, no. I know it's, I know what you're saying, where sometimes when you don't feel stuff, you feel lethargic. This is just... Wiping you. I just need, just need to sleep. I just need to sleep. And that's just, again, it could be the liver disease and all the medication I'm taking. But if that's the, if that's the worst of it, then I'd rather than that, than yeah. having yellow eyes popping out of my head and stuff like that. Yeah, yellow. Do you get yellow tongue as well from it, I think? Or something. I didn't get them symptoms, no. no. Uh, but it can be bad. It can go into your skin and everything and... Could be tobacco looking, fingers could and be stuff. looking like Homer Simpson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Future football ambitions. Yeah. Um I always said I um my ultimate goal would be to be Ipswich Town manager. Um that's changed a bit. Um I'm not sure if I want to be a coach. Like I said, I think there's a real um uh, difference between a coach so, and a manager. Um, I need to find out um, whether that's being a coach or being a manager. I think time will tell as I start to build this journey up. But um, we talked about Ipswich and I've left Ipswich in a moment and um, I'm probably 99% sure I'm, I'll never go back to, to Ipswich to work. So um, Is that a shame? Um yeah, it is a shame, um, but I think because I'm a local boy, I support the club, my history with the club, I think that emotionally I'm too connected to the club yeah. and obviously the club has just been taken over and there's a new CEO and new owners and their vision of the club is not my vision of the club so I could be a hypocrite and just keep my head down and do the job and be unhappy but I'm a bigger person than that one thing you get from me is honesty and I don't want to be going home unhappy or bitching about this and bitching about that so uh, it was best that I removed myself from that situation um, that's not disrespecting the new owners and the new CEO. Everyone's got their opinions of how football clubs should be run. Um, I just have my... Um, I just have my reasonings and, like I said, I've this twice I've left that club now and even if new owners and stuff came in and stuff, I just... You can never say never in football, but like yeah. I said, for me to say 90 pint... 99%. 90 point. Yeah, 99% sure that I'll probably never go back there. And it is a shame, but. Um, it's a shame when something so close to home seems so foreign. You know, you said these are the. So, yeah, something so something close. Like Cardiff from, City, you know. Something so close to home seems so far away. That's the perfect way to describe it. Uh, but yeah, who, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, could be a being Craig. Uh, oh, well, can you imagine you two? I'd be good. I'd be the good coach. You would you be the manager? He be the coach, or he's definitely a manager. He's a good coach, but he he he's gonna be a number one. He's yeah. He, he shocked me when I went to Anderlecht with him out there to see him. Um, so do you think he's got another like another coaching job 
before he goes manager, do you think? Or do you think he could go straight into manager because obviously there's talks? Well, again... By the time this comes out, we might even have... A yeah, <laughs> he's... It's hard getting opportunities as well. It's very hard for black people to get opportunities. Uh, That's, that is a fact, isn't it? There's not many black managers, is there really? No, no, because... And I think I the think, ones were always coaches. I think... I think we're up to forty percent of black players in in the top leagues or stuff or something, and then there's only like four percent. It's ridiculous. Of black managers and listen, it is changing. Society's changing. Like the girls are now getting empowered, and uh, girls are getting empowered probably more at a quicker rate than black people are at the moment, but. There is change. Uh, Patrick Vieira is doing extremely well, so it just goes to show that when black people do get given job opportunities that they can do it. Um, and like you said, there's a few coaches. I think Brendan Rodgers is brilliant. So Brendan Rodgers at Leicester, he's got... He signs a lot of uh, African players, uh, African-French players, and he doesn't know the culture culture of these people and he c probably can't get into their psyche as well as Colo Torre so he brings Colo Torre onto his staff and they've always been very close as well haven't they but that's just and it's not being it's not being disrespectful but if there was a Craig was a manager and he's got 60% of his playing staff are black I think that I can have a better understanding of them than Craig. So it's quite staggering that you've got this percentage of players. Yeah. Um, but you haven't got the the black staff to... It's common sense. To mentor, yeah, well. Uh, but listen, times are changing. You just need football clubs to change now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's going to win the league? Man City. Who's winning the Champions League? Man City. Oh, behave. Man City. Yeah. <laughs> and who's winning the FA Cup? No, not Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, listen, it's just, could you imagine if Klopp wasn't around, then probably Pep would win everything every year in the same way. It's just, yeah, yeah. It is, people say, because it makes me laugh because everyone talks about how great our league is. It's the best league in the world and, Everybody can beat everybody. Well, that's not true because when Man United, when we were playing, when Man United were winning the league, they were winning the league with 80-something points and stuff like yeah, that. One of us races. Liverpool and Man City are winning the league with 99 points and 90. Did Man City get to 100 points one season yeah. or nearly? Like, it's basically turning into the Real Madrid-Barcelona, how it used to be. <laughs> I dare say Celtic Rangers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how they've gone. It's fair play to them too. They've took it to a whole new level. I've got four names. Yep. If you can tell me what you think of these people. I'm going to say the, this one is because he's Welsh. Gary Speed. The most professional, professional football player I've ever seen. Um, trained like he played. Um, Alan Shearer was the captain of Newcastle. Gary Speed was our real captain. He was the glue. He had this uncanny, uh, uncanny kind of ability to go into every click and fit and gel. So there was the foreigner, the French boys. He could go and he could go out on a night out with them if he were, if he had to be. The young lads, the brat pack, the older lads. Um, he was one of them you always knew was going to go on to be a manager. Um, which he looked like he was going to have a real promising career. Um, I had to break the news to, obviously, Craig, who was very close to him. And, yeah, that one hit hard. Uh, it hit hard, especially, I think, about a couple of weeks later. I um Because, obviously, I think you've suffered from mental health problems, Craig's sent from mental health problems. So with Gary Speed, it was about two weeks after his death, 
and Man City were playing Liverpool in the League Cup semi-final. And Craig invites his boys to the box, um, Gary's dad and his two sons to the box. Ed was, one was called Ed and I can't remember the other one. And I've gone to watch Craig. Craig's playing for Liverpool at the time. Craig has an unbelievable game. And I was blown away how brave these two boys were. And it got me to have the emotion of anger towards Speedo. Because I'm like, how the fuck can you leave these two little soldiers? I don't care what's going on in your life. For you to selfishly, this is how I was feeling at the time, because I didn't really know about the mental health situation. It's like, that is the most selfish act ever. But then obviously as more and more high profile people have come out about mental health and how it is taboo for men and how they don't seek the help, that's how bad mental health is, that you can leave two little angels behind and think that you're probably doing it for the best. It's fucking, it's, it's mad. So yeah, he was a, a true professional. Again, talking about careers, if I had his mindset and his professionalism, then <laughs> I'd have been flying. <laughs> Great bloke. Yeah. Alan Sheeda. Shearer. Be honest. Yeah, of course. <laughs> wow. As the person or as a player or just everything? I think the full package, really. How, you know, the runnings you had with him. I say this a lot about great players is that they're self-driven and selfish in a way that football is a team game but there's that element of selfishness to it and that's what makes these players so great I feel and I feel that when you hear a sheer interview and he scored two and we've lost three, two. And he's like, oh, it's not about the goals. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> because he was just driven by goals. He was, he was, again, where I said Gary Speed was a, the real captain I don't think Alan was a captain who would come round to all the cliques and make sure everything... He was just a captain because he was an inspirational footballer and a leader in that way, if you know what I mean. Um, I got on really well with Al. I liked Al. I like Al. I was talking about it as a, pipe, a thing, <laughs> a past tense. But he was... Um, I just... This was before Ronaldo and and all these players come along and the Messi's. And I always thought that to be that great, you come first rather than the team. And I I I stick by that with Al. Um he might say no if we lost, I, yeah, okay, you probably would be peed off that you lost, but Nice to have two goals to soften that blow. Yeah. When you... I do look at him as a great player, not a great captain. Uh, what makes a great captain? That's what I'm saying. Like people talk about great coach. What makes a great coach? So if you're inspiring your team for uh, with your performances, then you're doing something right. But the best captain I ever had was Lucas Neal. And that was just because of what he would do off the pitch for everybody and team building exercises. And yeah. just, there's no right or wrong way. It's just what works for certain individuals. But I, I'm, I'm with you. I prefer the captain who can go 
go to every clicks and check in uh, with everybody. Um, and, and and how did? Um, Graham Sunas. <laughs> Graham Sunas is the only manager I played for that I actually feared. Um, it was now coming to the stage of the game where players were having too much power and he couldn't live with that. Um, and he was still old school and that didn't sit right with him. Um, obviously, at the Newcastle, he came in, he was meant to come in to sort the Brat Pack. He offered out Craig in a fight. He said he was going to smash me and... Um, what did what did Craig say? Craig shit himself. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, he did shit himself. He gave him some back, but then when Graham went for the pounce, he fucking thought, "What the fuck's going on here?" Uh, it, we were all in shock. But so, like when I'm talking about old school, where we got to the cup semi final, the UEFA Cup. And Lauren Baird did an article hammering Sooners or something saying he's not enjoying his football. And it was the morning of the game and we were 1-0 up against Sport and Lisbon after the first leg. And Sooners comes on with the newspaper articles faxed over and he throws them at Lauren Robert and says, get the fuck off the bus. So Lauren Robert gets off the bus. He's not playing. He was meant to be playing. And they played a high line that day. And I score early to make it 2-0 on aggregate. And we had Lee Bowyer playing on the left. He weren't really a left winger. But if Lauren Robert was playing that, that left wing, we win that game convincingly. That's just my opinion on it. But, like, he kind of, for the to prove a point, it cost the team, if you know what I mean. And I just feel that a Sir Alex Ferguson or a Sir Bobby would have dealt with it different, won the game. Yeah. Then dealt with it. But that was just, again, just that old school approach. And do you think, Sorry, do you think that's why you would probably not manage again? And, you know, this is punditry and stuff now, but... 100%. Do you think he's just a dinosaur uh, when it comes no, to the game? No, I don't think he's a dinosaur because he's one of... When he speaks, he's, pundit, he's but... a very good pundit. I just feel that... I just feel that he is a manager and he's from that era where the manager run the football club recruitment yeah, this yeah. that this that and then you look at football clubs now they have a recruitment someone who buys the players they have a sporting director they, and I just don't think that would sit right with sure. Graham yeah. um, but I played some great football with Graham Sooners um, I liked him I, <laughs> I did I really did I just he was he used to join in training and fucking elbow smash players and just mad. <laughs> yeah. Mad. And I think finally it's only right that we finish with the man who, who made this happen and that's Craig Bellamy. Yeah. Um, Be honest again. <laughs> no, like I said, I really, I've got nothing but nice things to say about him. Um, he would do anything for anyone if you're a friend. Um, he has opened up about his mental health. Uh, I remember going, like I said, like going out to Anderlecht to see him and he was basically in a flat on his own. And if you're dealing with mental health problems and you finish your work and you go back and you're in between them four walls and it was just, I'm glad he's took his break and got out of there because you could tell it was just having a strain of his life and since I've been speaking to him, since I speak to him, sometimes we speak every other day, sometimes we go a couple of weeks without speaking but he seems to be in a real good headspace. He's ready to crack on again and... um he was probably underrated as a player. 
people don't realise how good he was until they actually played with him. And um, what I liked about him is that teammates wanted to beat him up or teammates hated him and all you see him is snarling, the big snarl, but he never wanted players to do anything that he wasn't doing. It'd be, he was one of the first, even back in them days, you'd always eat right and um, in the gym. And I always say the biggest compliment I can pay to him is that I was like naturally rapid, quick. When Craig was at Coventry and at Norwich, he was fast, but he wasn't quick. So by the time he was at Newcastle and he was absolutely rapid, that was because of what he did in the gym with his Olympic lifts every day, bang, bang, to get that 5 10%. So he also used to train like a speedo. And if he see people not pulling their weight, it would dig them out. But he's not digging them out to try and do something that he wouldn't put himself through. And like you said, some people hated it, told him to fuck off and that, but he wasn't having it. And um, I just loved that about him and I loved that he played on the edge. We talked about earlier about the, the Lee Bowers and the Joey Bartons, they have to have that edge. And when Sooners came in and you could tell Sooners wanted to, uh, he wanted to prove a point to the the Brat Pack is what we were called at the time. And Craig lost his edge. It was like Craig knew the game and Craig was quiet on the pitch and Craig was quiet in training and he started to see a shell of the man. So in a way, even though it probably made us a lesser team and I lost a good mate, he needed to leave at that time because he needed to get that edge back. And uh, probably the biggest compliment I could say is that I think he's had an unbelievable career in some of the clubs he's played yeah. at. He's played the biggest kids. But I'm telling you, as a coach, I think he could even be better. I was shocked um, how good he was as a coach. He's insight, tactical knowledge. Um, he's got a very uncanny gift of... Um, connect them with these players as well. So, um, yeah, watch this space. Keenan, it's been a it's been a wonderful interview. Um, yeah. There's one thing I'd like to ask you: um, if you could look down that camera, or which one, this one here, if there's anything you could say to the people watching, anyone going through any tough times, you've had a hell of a lot gone through your life. If there's anything you can send to the people watching, well, first off is. Don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. <laughs> um, but I think they say life begins at 40. And you kind of like, life begins at 40. But when we're 20 to 30, we are very immature. You're going to make so many mistakes as a person. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person at all. That's just part of your journey. That's just part of you learning. And I think you'll be the first to admit from 20 to 30, even 30 to 40, your brain's still nowhere near where it should be and you're going to make mistakes and don't beat yourself up too hard. Learn from your mistakes and come back. And by the time, like you said, you get to my age as a wily old man, then you'll be proud of yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror and you'll say, you know what, I'm proud of what I've become and hopefully you can all do that as well. So um, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, hopefully the next time you speak to me, I've got a brand new liver and I'm kicking ass. Mate, I just want to shake your hand. You'll have to come to me because I'll break this chair. <laughs> Keep it, man. Honestly, thank you so much. Guys, I hope you enjoyed done this one, yeah? I hope you enjoyed this one, guys. Um, what a privilege. <laughs> what a privilege. What we going to in quite some time man, didn't we thank you guys if you enjoyed this type of setup let us know in the comments let us know what you think of Kieran and we'll see you all soon stay central the central club